And now on the line is Daniel Corley, the manager of the Ratcron Visitor Centre in Roscommon. Daniel, welcome to the programme. Thanks very much for having me. Daniel, as well as being involved with Near FM and Radio and Lyft in Dublin, I also have a bit of a Roscommon connection and I have a Roscommon YouTube channel, so it was only going to be a matter of time before I got in touch with you. I visited your centre once, but I've yet to do a tour of your area. What inspired me to contact you to do this interview today, as opposed to a later date, is that I read the article in this month's The National Geographic about your area. I imagine that you are delighted with the publicity, international publicity of the article. This is a big question, but for the benefit of some of our listeners today from Dublin who might know about your area and centre, could you tell them what uh, the Rock Crow, uh, the Rock Crow area is and your centre and why the National Geographic published an article about you this month? Absolutely, Dan. So, effectively, Rathcrown is a group of 240 identified archaeological sites encased in a plateau of about six and a half square kilometres. And it's it's located just about four kilometres outside of the village of Tulsk. Now, this is regarded as the the prehistoric and early historic royal site for, for the Western Territory of Connacht. And anyone that would have driven past um, the on the N5 going from Dublin to, say, Westport or Ballina or to the West Coast uh, along this road would have driven right through Rathcrown. So if you're thinking about an equivalent um, closer to Dublin, you're talking about something similar to the likes of the Hill of Tara in County Meath or maybe Dunolina in County uh, Kildare, which is the Leinster Royal site. So these these are locations where we see um, human settlement, um, particularly at Cron, for about 5,500 years, a continuous settlement. We see a particularly pronounced period of activity in the late Iron Age, so about 2,000 years ago, broadly speaking. And there are various different types of um, archaeologies we see out there. We see everything from burial mounds through to settlement sites, through to great temple sites and even down to um, the subject or the principal subject of the National Geographic article which was the cave of Owen Nagoth or U of Nagoth, U of Nagoth being the cave of the cats and this is um, a very interesting combination of archaeology and geology where our ancestors about 1500 years ago uh, sought to attach a, a man-made entrance onto uh, this natural limestone cavern. Now this, ca- this cavern, the cave in and of itself and access into it are all associated with this idea of entering into the Irish other world, which is a, is a landscape not like Hell or Hades or Valhalla or any of these foreign concepts, but it's probably more familiar to us if we consider the, 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 the landscape known as Tiernan and Oak. So that was the subject of the National Geographic article by and large because Uvnagoth and its associations with the other world are principally seen around the festival of Samhain or Ihahauna. We now know it today in modern terms as Halloween, that great global festival which we're probably all familiar with, is, has its origins in Ireland. And it has its origins very strongly around this cave at Uvnagoth, which uh, provides access um, at one particular point in the year for a whole host of malevolent creatures and beings that depart out of the cave and basically create a world ready for winter. So they, they talk about birds that have a breath that so far it takes the leaves off the trees through to monstrous creatures that cause chaos on the landscape and basically herald the beginning of the dormant season of the winter. And that's that's part of the reason why um, Rathcrown is so special and why we, we, we interpret it as a, as a visitor centre, museum and guided tours. Okay, uh, we'll come back in a couple of few minutes to talk a bit more about Ihehauna or uh, Halloween. Uh, has the whole Rathcrown area been fully excavated, Daniel? No, because the the nature of the size of it and its uh, complexity um, means that it would be impossible to excavate it in one sense, but also um, the uh, an alternative approach was arrived at in terms of understanding the archaeology, and that was arrived at um, principally by NUI Galway, the National University in Galway. Um, in the early 1990s, be, they began a, a suite of geophysical or remote sensing investigations think about them like an x-ray or an MRI scan of the land and they basically use these non-invasive approaches to, to peer beneath the earth and get a sense of what the archaeology beneath um, is going to tell us. So it's very, very interesting some of the outputs and the discoveries that they uncovered in that manner and the beauty of that approach is that not a single set of earth has been turned for the purpose. So that's the approach that was taken um, in in the early 1990s and that type of research has continued up to the present day. Um, in the future, there are probably opportunities for us to be able to engage in targeted excavation on a small scale and uh, nearly use the geophysics as a, 
as a an MRI scan or a, an X-ray in advance of keyhole surgery, if we want to borrow from the medical parlance. So that's the approach that we've advocate, advocated for over here, which means that some of these monuments have been untouched um, and left extant, I suppose, really. In some cases, 2,000 years, 1,500 years, but even as far back as 5,500 years, and the only thing that's interpreted them or interacted with them, rather, is, is the cattle and sheep grazing and the visitors walking across them. I didn't actually know there was such a machine that can do that. I, must, I suppose in one sense it's not surprising with today's technology, but it's great the way you can do that. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine from Italy recently, and I was telling him that I'm doing this interview with you today. I, I, he, told, he told me that if he was Irish, he would be infuriated with the Irish government and the tourism authorities for not doing enough to promote our Celtic history. He said that in Italy, the government takes the preservation of their history a lot more seriously and he said that we in Ireland have a lot of hidden history that isn't being excavated. Would you agree with him on what he was saying? It's an interesting, com it's an interesting comment. Um, it's We would work very tightly with um, both our local authority and with the, the state agencies for the preservation of the heritage of this area and that's part of the reason why there's 240 archaeological sites still extant out of Rathcrohan. In terms of the, the tourism aspect of it and trying to encourage tourism into rural areas such as this. Um, it's certainly an issue that we've had over the last number of years where um, tourism hasn't really been top of the agenda, particularly in the Midlands, where by distinction to the Wild Atlantic Way or Dublin or Ireland's Ancient East, um, they're more prominently disposed and there's been a lot more focus placed on attracting tourism into those areas. The Midlands of Ireland, uh, Roscommon and East Leitrim and places like East Clare and East Scoray, They've been, I suppose, underserved for a long time, but that's started to change. In the more recent past, we've had the introduction of um, Ireland's Hidden Heartlands as the tourism proposal for this area. And we've seen some great changes in what we've we've um, engaged with from a tourism perspective. So it's a, it's a growing portion. It's a, it's a part of the world, the Midlands of Ireland particularly, wouldn't routinely um, have been considered as a tourism destination for quite a long period. So it's all about building that and developing it and bringing it in, in, in scaffolded into an environment that we can we can treat with larger quantities of visitors. But at the same time, we have to balance that against the local communities that reside here. And my priority as visitor centre manager, as the archaeologist, chief archaeologist attached to the Rathcrohan project, um, is primarily to, to take care of the local community and to the farmers at Rathcrohan and, and then the visitors come after that. So I want I want sustainable tourism. So I, I'm not interested in large gatherings of people that can, can, can leave the residue on the land and on the area that might not be positive. So it's a case about balancing this correctly and at Rathgarn we're building it in a slow and gentle way that, that'll allow us to achieve that. Okay. I find it fascinating that Halloween celebrated every year is actually traced back to Rathcrohan, isn't it? It's I, I find it fascinating to you. Well, absolutely it's the case. I mean when you consider when you consider Halloween as we conceive of it as a modern concept, it's something that's uh, difficult to kind of understand in true terms, but when you start um, picking away at the different layers of it and bringing it back to its base origins in its Irish context and in its local context here at Rathcrohan, it's a case that it really speaks to a, a very, very deep and inherent attachment to the land and an understanding of how the ch changes of the seasons were so important to our ancestors as they strove to, to keep food on the table and keep produce um, available and keep keep uh, danger from their door. So it's a case that with all of those things in mind in a pre-Christian context, it's a case that it's 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 a really fascinating narrative and it's something that's so rooted in our DNA and, and something that, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm very privileged to be able to interpret with the visitor and, um, I, you know, I'm very thankful every day to be able to say that I'm employed in my own county as an archaeologist uh, in, in rural Ireland and in interpreting such interesting landscapes as Rathcrohan. And uh, am I right in saying that it's the ha Halloween, the night started from Irish emigrants in Amer in America. They start they kind of brought over their history of s s sound, and it started from Irish emigrants in America. From there, did it? Certainly, I mean the the, the exchange of, of cultural ideas, um, particularly over to the urban centres. I mean, when we were when we were looking back, maybe 150, 200 years, you're talking about you know carving turnips, and you're talking about engaging in attributes that kind of around divination and uh, paying respect to the dead in, in, in our local homesteads in, in rural Ireland. That would have been the approach taken, but obviously with, with the famine and with 
all the various turbulence that took place in the 18th and 19th centuries, you can understand that the mass immigration, our ancestors brought their ideas with them across the, the various seas and, and waters. And I suppose it's interesting when you put our cultural constructs into a different environment, how, how it you know gets changed up and mutates and evolves through time. And now it's been repackaged and now, you know, walking around, you know, the, the towns and, and cities of Ireland, you'll, you'll see pumpkins everywhere. And and they they have their origins carved pumpkins as as you know the carving of turnips in times past in 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 in, in Ireland. So be, be, before Halloween, uh, <coughs> as we know, it started. Sound was celebrated by some people in Irish people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean that, that that's it's one of the major festivals of the year in in a pre-Christian and a, and a, and in a, in a even in a Christian mindset. The fact that we have All Saints Day and All Souls Day in such close vicinity to to Halloween shows that even in the Christian cal- calendar, it's it's attaching itself very deliberately to the older festival. So, I mean, Samhain is, is something that would have been celebrated all throughout the Gaelic world. Um, and and it would have been seen as a, as a way of marking the change over from the harvest season of autumn, where you're gathering in your produce through to the dead season of the winter, when you're, you're trying to sustain yourself, perhaps through a very difficult period of the year from a weather point of view or temperature point of view, until you get back around to the first growth of spring with Imbolc, um, which is now St. Bridget's Day on the 1st day of February. Sound S- S- must have been celebrated up until before Halloween fairly recently, was it? In the 20th, 19th century, was it? Well, in some respects, I mean, uh, the, 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 the Halloween that I know it as a, as a 33-year-old man from South West Common um, has only come on the scene in the last uh, 20 years, 15 years. I mean, the idea of trick-or-treating, the idea of... Um, pumpkins being a part of the Halloween celebration at home is something that's only a very recent arrival in the last couple of years. Like, whereas when I was a child, I mean, bobbing for apples and engaging in the older traditions of Halloween and Samhain, which have been, you could argue, going on for hundreds of years prior to that, that's still going on in 1990s rural Ireland. And you could argue in parts of the country it's still going on today in that older fashion. Okay. I read only in the last couple of years that there is such a thing as some people having a bit of a phobia about Halloween and that the uh, condition is called sound-a-phobia. I find this amazing as well. Do you? <laughs> it's a, that's a rather, str- yeah, it's a rather strange idea, but you can understand it in some respects when you consider that it's full of all these uh, images and ideas of, of frightening creatures and, and uh, you know, and go, uh, all, all of that, the, the terror and the the horror films that kind of uh, base themselves around this time of year. I suppose it's quite understandable that some people would would have a, an aversion um, towards a festival that it, it, it's not a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's something that comes around every year, and it's part of our normal cycle. It's our rural calendar in 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 relief. So it's a case that you can you can understand uh, why certain attributes of the, the modern Halloween would be quite frightening to people. And, yeah, I can see where the phobia might have originated from. Yeah, a lot of people, I think, are afraid of bangers and fireworks, you know, especially in urban areas. There's a lot of dogs that get terrified of the bangers. So, Absolutely, you know? yeah. Um, I find it great as well, we mentioned there, sonophobia. I find it great the way that they spell sound correctly uh, in sonophobia because I don't, <laughs> I don't personally like the way the whole anglicization of Irish language words, you know. Um, okay, yes. Daniel, uh, I believe you are hoping that your site becomes the uh, y- y- UNESCO World Heritage Site, aren't you? Yeah, it's something that we're we're treating with, and we're we're trying to deliver over time. If it's suitable to the local communities um, at Rathcrown, and if it's going to be a benefit to us, it's something that we're striving to achieve. And um, the uniqueness of the archaeology and the mythological landscape, and the historical landscape, and the cultural landscape at Rathcrown um, is something that uh, it, it deserves to be known and a greater awareness and recognition established of it um, globally. And as long as it can bring a lot of benefit to the communities that reside here and call Rathcroft on their home. Yeah, we're, we're, we're walking towards that in its various guises. So it's a long and very arduous process, um, but it's something that we're, we're constantly on our back burner and trying to, trying to achieve if we can do. Do you have the support yet of the Irish government? Very much so. Um, the National Monument Service is, uh, and the Department of Heritage are, are the principal um, leaders alongside with the local authority in Roscommon County Council. There's the three um, state agencies that we're working with um, deliberately on the process. So it's a case that uh, they're trying to achieve it if it's something that can be achievable and is of interest and benefit to the area. So it's it, they're listening to us and they're, they're trying to hear what we're, we're having to say because th- there's as much good and bad coming from 
uh, misplaced UNESCO bids as anything else. And we need to make sure that everyone from the person that's farming the fields through to the visitor and everyone in between is um, sees sees UNESCO as a positive thing. So if it isn't a positive thing for everyone, then there's no point in, in delivering it. But yeah, for, certainly the, the Irish government is well behind us in what we're trying to achieve. Oh, that's cool. Okay, Diana, can you tell our listeners today on Near FM if they were to visit, if they are to visit your centre, what they can expect as regards guided tours? Absolutely. So there's a couple of different options as you come to Rathcron. Uh, we run our guided tours at 12 noon daily, Monday to Friday, um, all the way through the, the winter season. Um, we're, clo- we're opened all year, uh, except for the week of Christmas. And then during the summertime, which is from May to the end of August, we offer a second tour at 2pm every day as well. And that brings people out onto the archaeological landscape. It's usually two to two and a half hours in length. And it, we go and have a deep dive into the archaeology and the mythology that surrounds Rathcrohan. It's also supplemented by our museum. Um, we've, we're an award-winning museum here um, that provides a very, very uh, high-quality introduction to what Rathcrohan is all about. And a visitor doesn't necessarily have to go on a guided tour to experience Rathcrohan. They can do the museum. They can go on a, on a self-guided walk if they wish either. And we're currently walking in different um different projects that may deliver hopefully in time a walking trail through the landscape as well so there's a number of different ways in which you can explore the place and um one of, one of them and the one that we get a lot of distinction for is the, the guided site store okay tell me how much the tour costs so an adult standard rate for a guided tour is 15 euro and uh, a rate into the museum for an adult is, is 5 euro and there are concessions then for everyone from seniors through to students and children and all children under the age of 10 are free on our um, guided tours and on our museum visits. Okay Daniel, to come towards the end of our interview, could you give out the contact details of your centre please? Absolutely, uh, the easiest way to contact us is by going to www.rathcrohan.ie and that'll be able to guide you through to booking your guided tours. Uh, all our email contact details are also available on the website. And uh, if you wanted to call us, you can call us at 0719639268 to discuss things more, and you can book over the phone as well.